But here is the claim. If you form the chain partition from a maximum matching, the chain partition will be a Dilworth partition. It will use the minimum number of chains. Now, this example is too small to be challenging. Clearly, the width of this post set is three. Clearly, there's a maximum anti-chain of size three, namely the maximal elements. There are three edges in the maximum matching. The fact that three equals three is an accident of small numbers. Again, it is not the case that the size of the matching is the width, not in general. Go back to the dot cam. If this chain partition comes from a maximum matching, we are going to conclude that the width is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's got seven chains, but the size of the, match, the matching was 13. There's a disconnect between them. They're related, but they're not the same. Okay, now, here's where you should be in your head right now. I get it that if you give me a matching, I can get a chain partition. I get it that the bigger the matching is, the smaller the chain partition is. But what I don't get is why if the matching is maximum, the chain partition is minimum, and I don't see an anti-chain of that size. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What we need to explain is if that chain partition was assembled from a maximum matching, then there's an anti-chain of size seven then we really will have solved the Dilworth problem because we will have found a chain partition of a certain number of chains, and we will have found a maximum anti-chain of that same size. End of story. All right, now, how to do that? There's a technical detail, which I'm going to go through and try to explain to you. It's, it's a subtlety here. So listen carefully and keep your brain open. I'm not drawing the post set. I'm not drawing the bipartite graph. Do you see them in your mind? Post set. Bipartite graph. With the matching that's reflected by this chain partition being a maximum matching. Turn on Ford Fulkerson on the network that you get by attaching a source and a sink and carrying out our labeling algorithm. What will happen? What will happen? The labeling algorithm will halt without labeling the sink. It will start by labeling the source. It will do some scans, and it will do more scans and do more scans. And then it will result in some vertices in my network being labeled, starting with the source. But it will always result in some unlabeled vertices, one of which will be the sink. And that's how we get the cut whose capacity is the value of the flow, and the value of the flow is nothing but the size of that matching, in other words, 13. Now imagine it. There's some labeled vertices, 
and there are some unlabeled vertices. I don't care about the source, it's labeled. I don't care about the sink, I know it's unlabeled. It's these guys. Some of them are labeled, and some of them are unlabeled. Don't be thinking that these are the labeled and these are the unlabeled. It's much more complicated than that. Much more complicated. There's some labeled over here and some unlabeled over here. Can go back and forth. 